Testing. There we go. All right, good evening to our uh, Public Safety Forum. Um, uh, Ward 2 City Council Tom Monahan and Ward 1 C City Council Tim Cruz. We decided to host this night uh, where we've had all these shootings lately and our wards basically, it's, of course, it is across the city, but it seems to be concentrated in uh, this area. Um, Tim's going to give you the ground rules and introductions. Um, all I'm going to do is introduce the elected officials who are here tonight. Uh, we have State Rep. Uh, Mike Brady, uh, State Rep. Jeff Deal, uh, Ray Hensington, uh, School Committee, Ward 7, Ozzy Jordan, School Committee, Ward 6, and Mark Lindy, Southeastern Eastern Regional School Committee. And now I'll hand it over to Tim. Thank you. If you noticed, we didn't introduce, uh, there's a lot of candidates here tonight, and we specifically didn't introduce them because this is not a campaign event for anybody. So that's part of my ground rules for tonight. I just want people to know we are very fortunate. This was called pretty hastily. Tom called me last week and said, we need to do something. We need to get some, get some people together to explain. Part of the problem that we have as counselors is nowadays people only seem to get their information from the Internet. And just because it's on the Internet doesn't mean it's correct. In fact, it's usually wrong. So we were talking, we said we need to find a way to be able to get all the people that, that are fighting this fight or leading this fight together to explain to the public what we are doing and what's going on right now. Because it's pretty scary right now. And I mean, the headlines in the enterprise, and not, to, I'm not trying to bash enterprise, they do what they can, but the headlines are there and then no real full story afterwards uh, about what's happened and why those shots are happening. But we, we're fortunate tonight, as I look behind me, and I'm not going to introduce the table, Mayor Carpenter will do that in a minute, we actually have the FBI here tonight, we have ICE, we have uh, Major Thomas from the uh, State Police. These are really the heavy hitters that are here helping us in Brockton to attack this issue. And it's a, it's a major issue, and it, all the other work we as a council and as a city government do gets followed by, by this violence. And uh, so that's why Tom and I decided we... We would get this together and try to just get the information out to the public. And uh, so we will have everybody up here. We'll give you some information. We have a presentation on the uh, shot spotter that uh, we've had some of in the past, but we have a whole new uh, uh, version of it. We'll starting to be in, uh, installed, I believe, tomorrow, but the mayor can talk about that. After that, we'll allow questions from the audience. And again, please ask questions. Some of these outfits are here. They work for us, but they don't have to be in Brockton. They're here because they realize there's a big issue. So we're here to ask questions. This is not a campaign event. Please keep your question to a minute and ask a specific question, and we'll try to get all the answers we can for everybody. So with that being said, the questions will be at the end of the night, and we'll just line up in the middle. You'll see me come down there. But for now, I want to introduce our Mayor Bill Carpenter, who will run the program from up here. Thank you, Tim. First of all, I would like to open uh, by thanking both uh, Councilors Cruz and Monaghan for organizing tonight's event. Uh, I want to thank all the residents that are here in the room with us tonight for taking the time to be here and for caring enough about our city to be here. I know we're all here because, you know, we're concerned about our city. And we're concerned about public safety. We're concerned about our neighborhoods. And there's no one more concerned than I am and there's no one more determined than I am to turn this city around. But what tonight is really about, it's about communication, two-way communication. So this is an opportunity for myself and the police chief and the various law enforcement agencies to inform you about ongoing efforts every day in this city to reduce crime and particularly to reduce gun violence. But I think also it's very important for us to emphasize tonight is that tonight is also an opportunity for you to speak to us, for the community to ask questions and get information. And so we'll go in two parts to the program. The first part of the program, uh, I'll open up with remarks, but I'll call on each of the various law enforcement agencies up here to speak for a few minutes to give you some insight as to the type of work they're currently doing in the city um, because I think that you'll be impressed by the number of agencies and the scope of work that is going on by law enforcement agencies on a daily basis here in the city. 
And then the second part of the program will be an opportunity, as Councilor Cruz mentioned, for you to ask uh, specific questions of all the various public safety officials that we have with us here tonight. I do want to also thank all of the agencies that are represented here. Um, as Councilor Cruz mentioned, uh, you know, this is a big ask for us to ask them to come in here and, and appear in a public forum and many of them traveled, many of them changed their schedules and we put this together on really just a few days notice. So um, I guess I should start by, for those that can't read the name placards at the back of the room, I'm just going to go down the table from your left, my right, and introduce the folks that are at the table. Uh, so actually Tom's out of order, but that's okay. Uh, City, Ward 2 City Councilor Tom Monahan. Uh, from ATF is Jacob Derrick. Uh, then we have Lieutenant Ken LeGrice, who is the Chief of Detectives for the Brockton Police Department. Then we have Major Anthony Thomas, who is from the Massachusetts State Police. Seated immediately next to me to your left, my right, is uh, Chief John Crowley of the Brockton Police Department. And as we go to the other side of the table, immediately to my left, is Plymouth County District Attorney Tim Cruz, uh, followed by Plymouth County Sheriff Joe McDonald, uh, Kevin White from the FBI, and Sean Gallagher from ICE. So we've got a very uh, wide-ranging panel of folks for you to hear from tonight uh, and to inform you on law enforcement efforts in Brockton. Uh, I think I want to open, I, I think that a lot of the talk tonight will be as it should be about what's happening right now, but I do want to say that our approach to public safety from day one is to be working on both long-term and short-term solutions, because we know that some of the real solutions are long-term solutions. So we are very committed to proactive school curriculum and programs for elementary and middle school children. Um, we want to position our young people to succeed in life. We want to position them to make good decisions. Uh, we know that's a very important strategy that takes time, but we're investing in it. You know, some examples of some of those programs that are going on right now, we have the Bridge Partnership with Bridgewater State University, where 100 Brockton, school middle, 100 Brockton middle school students just experienced a two-week college experience staying overnight on Bridgewater State University with college professors, with uh, college students as mentors, exposing middle school students to what college life is like to help them set that as a goal for themselves, for their own personal success, uh, to have a chance to experience college firsthand. Last summer, we established uh, a summer playground program for our younger children, ages 7 through 12. So now we've got five city playgrounds open four days a week during the summer, uh, where children between ages 7 and 12 have a safe place to go. High school and college students as camp counselors overseen by a certified teacher served a healthy breakfast and a healthy lunch every day for free. And the entire program is free. So s children of families that maybe don't have the money to send them off to an expensive summer camp have a safe place to go during the summer. And we're equally committed to after school programs, particularly at the middle school level because we know that grades six, seven, and eight are really the crucial years for us to be working with our young people that kids make decisions in grades six, seven, and eight that may determine how the rest of their life turns out. And we need to be really focusing with those kids. And I guess I'll use that as an opportunity to mention that at the next school committee meeting, uh, we'll be very pleased to announce the reinstatement of the middle school sports program this year in September. And uh, after a one year hiatus, we're bringing back middle school sports. There are some small changes to the program, but the most important thing is that it's still totally free. There's no user fee. There's no charge. You know, opportunities for young people here in the city of Brockton are based upon their ability, not their ability to pay. And we're really, I'm really thankful to the superintendent and the school committee for working closely with us to get that very important program reinstated. So having talked about all those things, uh, and also I want to mention, and the sheriff may mention his remarks, in terms of long-term solutions, we're working very closely with the sheriff on re-entry programs and adding services to re-entry programs and what we can do working with the sheriff uh, with people that are going to be transitioning from jail back into the community. Uh, and those are very important also. But I, I really don't think that's the main reason most of you are here tonight. 
Uh, I think that you want to know what are we doing today. I think that if you live on a street that's had gunfire on it, the shots have been fired, you're not really real interested in long-term solutions right now. You want to know what are we doing today to make your street and your neighborhood safer. So I'm going to try to share some of those strategies with you and then give each of the agencies an opportunity to fill you in in a lot more detail. I think from my standpoint and from the standpoint of Chief Crowley, perhaps the most important thing is what you see right up here in front of you across this table. It's our expanded commitment to interagency cooperation, uh, joint investigations, sharing of intelligence, sharing of resources, and that's what you're going to hear a lot about tonight. Uh, we know that the Brockton Police Department cannot do this on their own. We're just outnumbered. Uh, we should have 50 to 75 more police officers than we do. And part of the long-term solution is to get more boots on the ground. In the short run, we're in the process of hiring 15 new police officers. We have nine at the academy right now. We've already begun selecting the next class of six. So we will be adding 15 new officers, some of them on the street as soon as three months. Um, but I think that, is, and I'm going to let some of them talk about it, but the district attorney will talk about safe streets and uh, his work uh, coordinating with all of the agencies that you see here uh, in prosecutions that will lead to convictions and putting people away that are a threat to all of us on the streets. Um, I'm sure you'll, Chief Crowley will talk about joint operations also, uh, some ongoing discussions he's having right now with the Boston PD around uh, gang units. Uh, and Major Thomas will speak in just a minute about the resources the Massachusetts State Police has brought into the city since late May. Uh, and they're always here and they always have a presence, but they've had a much larger presence over the last couple of months uh, in response to our request. And, and uh, Major, we really appreciate everything that the State Police bring to the city on a daily basis. Uh, some of the other things that I think you may have noticed uh, is that there's new emphasis on proactive policing. Uh, the motorcycle unit was established last year, and now we've added, uh, we've brought back the bicycle police officers after eight years of not having bicycles. So when you're out there this summer, yeah, it's, it's important. You're seeing motorcycles and bicycles, and they're really... Um, particularly targeting parks, playgrounds, business districts, areas of concern, and uh, they're versatile. They're a big part of our new community policing strategy. Uh, these offices are very approachable, and, uh, and the key thing is that they are proactively targeting quality of life crimes. They're, trying to, they're routinely patrolling the playgrounds and the ballparks uh, to keep those areas comfortable for families and children to be able to enjoy. Um, and they're also proactively targeting quality of life street crimes, street level drug dealing, prostitution, crimes that may not seem like the biggest felonies we may face, but they're important to improving the quality of life for the residents of this city, and we've made that an emphasis. Um, the chief will also, I'm sure, talk about our increased commitment number of detectives to the gang and narcotics units. And I think I'd like to just take a minute to emphasize our investment in technology because assessing our situation over the last year and a half and realizing that a city the size of Brockton should have at least 50, if not 75, more police officers, anyone that's looked at the budget knows that we do not have the money to hire those officers today. I'm thrilled that we've got 15 coming on, which will actually be a net gain of two over full staffing. Um, so I think that what we have identified is that we can make some very strategic investments in technology to make the city safer and to make our police department and the other law enforcement agencies working in the city even more effective. And uh, that's money well spent. So we're making a major investment into video cameras. And uh, we actually met again on that today. And this is again when we talk about interagency cooperation, not just the city, but the school department, the housing authority, the parking authority, uh, all of these city departments, our building department, our D DPW, combining resources with our information technology department to develop a, a network of cameras across the city 
that the police department will have their own immediate access to. And uh, that's in the final stages of the computer design right now. Uh, cameras are being ordered. And uh, we anticipate when that is fully installed, we'll have about 100 cameras in strategic locations across the city that the police department will have a live view of at any time that they'd like to. Uh, we'll also talk, and we won't waste a lot of time on it tonight, uh, but also our efforts to develop a network of privately owned cameras across the city that will be GIS mapped for the police department so that when an incident does occur, they'll be able to immediately identify where there may be cameras in the neighborhood that may be useful to the investigation. In a few minutes, we'll have a presentation on shot spotter for you, as the councilor mentioned. Uh, but we're making a major investment in gunshot detection technology because we know getting our officers to the immediate location of where a gun has been fired uh, immediately, several minutes faster than it's possible to do it right now, makes the city safer. It dramatically increases our chances of getting the perpetrator leaving the scene. It also dramatically increases our opportunity to identify witnesses before they disappear. Um, Sheriff McDonald will have an announcement for us in a few minutes about fingerprinting technology. Uh, but it's a very exciting development with some grant money that the sheriff has been able to obtain uh, to provide Brockton Police Department with state-of-the-art fingerprint technology. So that a week ago, when the uh, police department fingerprinted someone, it took two to three months to get the information. Um, with the new technology, 10 seconds or less. Um, and this is a, just going to be a dramatic improvement making our police department and the other agencies working with us much more effective in identifying dangerous individuals that we want to make sure we don't put back out on the street. And we're also, I guess I have to say, investing in the human resources to use the technology. So during a year that we had to overcome a $6 million deficit in our budget, we have created a crime analyst position for the police department. And we're in the process of getting a sign off from our unions on the final job description, but it's in the budget. And it was one of the recommendations when we brought the call -in center in from UMass Boston, that we're about the only city of our size in the Commonwealth who did not have a full-time crime analyst to analyze and interpret crime data and generate reports for the chief of police. Uh, this is a um, critical piece of the strategy. It's a model that's established across the country. Charlotte, North Carolina gets a lot of recognition because if you can collect good data immediately, have the right person to analyze it and translate it into reports for the chief, we can readily identify hot spots. The chief can deploy our limited resources to where it's needed the most on a daily and weekly basis when we have that ability. So that's coming soon. And what's coming immediately, I believe next Monday, is we have uh, hired a civilian public safety IT tech because we're investing so much in our police and fire technology and communications equipment, we have to have technical support dedicated to public safety. And a lot of that was previously done by a uniformed police officer. Now it will be done by a highly qualified civilian working under IT. The net result of that is not only do we get them the tech support that they need, uh, but what we also do is when that next class comes out, we now have an additional patrol officer out on the street because we've replaced an in-house function uh, that was previously done by a uniformed officer with a civilian. Gets us another pair of boots out on the street. Uh, so, you know, we're here to answer questions, to talk about the efforts that are going on, Chief Crowley will talk a little bit about our community policing initiatives. Um, but at the end of the day, we need help from the community also. You know, we need a flow of information. And in the Chief's presentation, he'll distribute information uh, as to how we're using technology now to make it much easier for residents to anonymously send information to the police department. If we had 500 cops, we couldn't put one on every corner. There's 1,300 streets in the city. So we have to, it, this has to be two-way communication. When residents have knowledge of things that are going on in their neighborhood, they need to share that with the police. And we've had a couple just in the last couple of weeks, perhaps the chief can share one or two of those stories, recent successes. Uh, we arrested uh, a 
couple of drug dealers with a loaded gun just a week or two ago in a neighborhood based upon intelligence that was provided to us by residents of that neighborhood. It positioned us to be able to be in the right place at the right time, make an arrest, not just get a drug dealer off the street, but get a crime gun off the street. So without any more from me, I'd like to uh, give the various agencies uh, an opportunity to take a few minutes each and uh, talk about their efforts uh, working jointly with the Brockton Police Department uh, here in the city of Brockton. I think perhaps, uh, Major, if you don't mind me opening with you, uh, you know, when we had the last surge in gun violence, uh, which was around uh, mid to late May, uh, one of the things that uh, I did uh, with the Chief's blessing uh, was reach out to the state police for additional help. And uh, Major Thomas has really brought the troops in to help support the Brockton Police here over the past couple months in what I guess, Major, you would describe as a surge. And I'm going to turn the microphone over to you to describe the, uh, the work of the Massachusetts State Police. Just so you know, I didn't coin that term. It's been around a long time. But we'll take some credit for it. But I think the biggest takeaway before I even begin is this large turnout. What a great turnout. It shows all of us up here today that you're vested in your community, and more importantly, your neighborhood. And we need your help. We need that community police relationship to be built upon and expanded. So thank you all for coming out, and you deserve a round of applause tonight. A great turnout. And I just want to introduce to you, because I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce to you all the state police team, led by Captain Scott Warmington of the Plymouth County Detective Unit, Captain Warmington. <laughs> Sergeant Mike McCarthy of the gang unit, doing extraordinary work out here with Captain Warmington. <laughs> Our community action team, Captain Mike Doyle in the back. Trooper Andrew Mason out there, and that's Major Joe Mason's son, and Major Joe Mason was battling crime out here alongside me many years ago for several years. And Trooper Ryan Walzak. Ryan, stand up. Look, these people are committed to your neighborhoods and your safety, and they're working hard along with all our partners up here. So with that said, I just want to tell you, uh, just last week, the major chiefs met in D.C., and they were discussing gun violence. Chiefs from Chicago, in D.C., in New York City, in Baltimore, in Philadelphia, discussing gun violence and their trends. And they were also discussing what type of strategy that they were going to deploy collectively. So they got together, they brainstormed. And let me tell you this, firearms violence and drugs violence is the concern of the day. So it's not only an issue for you, it's an issue throughout this nation. And your professionals are talking about it and discussing it. And they mainly were discussing what type of community policing model was going to be deployed. And we've been talking about community policing models for several, several years, correct? Every time you turn on the TV or read something in the print media, it's all about community policing models. And they're effective, and they get tweaked along the way. But what was troubling and frustrating to them all was that many of these people are repeat offenders. We know that. And they talked about targeting impact players. Well, you know what? We're doing that in Brockton right now. We've been doing it for years, targeting impact players. But the greatest frustration for them all was that all these people are repeat offenders. Many of them are firearms repeat offenders. And in New York City, for an example, they have a three-year minimum. And, and they looked at some arrogant data, and I won't even tell you the number of firearm arrests that they looked at. And they found that it was extremely disturbing, the number of people actually going to jail. And they even said that what was more disturbing is that some of these repeat firearms offenders were getting a diversion program. 
no jail time, diversion program. So there's a conundrum of issues here where your police are working hard, your district attorney is working hard, and the courts are very, very strained. So what they decided was this, that we have to all pull together to tighten the firearms laws in the sentencing. That's what they came about. And I want you to Google it when you go home, the major cities chiefs meeting, and you can read it. But I just want to cite a few things from the article that I brought tonight. Other trends identified include gang-related activity and retaliatory violence. Sound familiar? Which half the cities reported seen an increase. Also, 30% of respondents said they think the use of synthetic drugs is contributing to the violence and reported they have encountered offenders who, under the, who are under the influence of drugs. Familiar stuff? The chiefs also recommended improving community partnerships, addressing the spread of synthetic drugs use and having the Justice Department track and, rep and report crime statistics for the major cities monthly so other chiefs can better follow the national trends. While the police departments have been working hard, they haven't been able to find a clear solution. If we had a strategy that was working, you know, we probably wouldn't have had to have a summit. He said, is there any easy answer? Believe me, that's the first thing I would have talked about. It's a major problem. We have some answers here. That's why you have all these people here working collaboratively, and we have a lot of successes. And other members of this uh, panel are gonna tell you about some of the successes, but I'm gonna tell you about the successes of our community action team. And in the 10 weeks they've been here, they've affected 165 arrests. 33 OUI arrests. Many of these OUI arrests are repeat offenders. We've cleared 84 warrants. We recovered five firearms. We've issued 241 citations, 246 warnings, 91 criminal summons, summonses, and 49 other arrests. And I'm gonna close by just telling you this. We're out here at late night, and a lot of these OUI arrests, the second, subsequent, we've, even, we've had a fifth offender, a fourth offender, a third offender, a third offender, and I wanna note this, just last Friday night on Belmont Street. Two officers made the arrest, Brenson Henson and Andrew De Silva from our community action team. They stopped the car on Belmont Street. They approached it. The operator was highly intoxicated. He had a lengthy uh, criminal record. He was a third offender, third offender of OUI arrest. And in his waistband, he had a 380 caliber, semi-automatic, fully loaded. That's the type of work we're doing out here in your communities. And, and we are making a difference. All of us are making a difference. So we need you to hang in there. We need you to continue to come out and show us support. We're working hard for you. We really are. So with that said, God bless you and thanks for coming out. Thank you, Major. Uh, why don't I let uh, a couple of our elected officials from Plymouth County have a chance to speak. Uh, Plymouth County District Attorney Tim Cruz is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer here in Plymouth County. Uh, he's been instrumental in uh, helping to align a lot of the agencies or all of the agencies that you see up here uh, with us in a coordinated effort in the city of Brockton. So, uh, Mr. District Attorney, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor. I also want to thank um, uh, Tim Cruz, Mr. Monahan, for calling this together. Uh, and I think that it's, it's great to have all these different agencies up here who have been working together for a, a significant period of time in trying to reduce the crime that occurs here in, in this urban community. And I, and I agree with the mayor at the outset. The, one of the biggest issues that we've had in Brockton, in, in my opinion, for the last 25 years is the lack of not having sufficient feet on the street from the police department. And that goes back to, I believe, 1990 when there was, I believe it was 40 police officers were laid off. And Brockton's had a challenging time getting enough guys back on the street. Because that's what makes, it, makes a real difference for the city, I believe, is the visibility and the presence of the police officers who will be out there and can respond quickly to when shots party goes off. That is something that's truly important for that to occur. 
and, and I think that what we end up seeing, you know, in the district attorney's office, we have roughly uh, approximately 60 lawyers, and every year in the county there's approximately 20,000 criminal cases. And the vast majority of the urban crime comes here out of the city, and that brings significant challenges, uh, and the only way that it would be resolved is by working together with this team of individuals, uh, Chief Crowley and the Brockton Police, uh, the state police, and our federal partners also, because many years back, uh, we were, if some of you probably recall, we, we'd have meetings here in this very, uh, the unknown school regarding the weed and seed meetings, the Project Safe Neighborhood weeding, meetings, the things such as that that were really, I think, powerful for the community and powerful for law enforcement. And unfortunately, those, um, those uh, federal programs went away. They, they're no longer in existence. And I think that created a challenge for uh, the city, because I think sometimes, unfortunately, you rely on grants. You should never do that because they could potentially go away. But you rely on grants, and you want to make sure that you don't do that. And when those programs went away, we still continued as best as they could, sharing information between all these different agencies. And that's not always easy. Uh, between you have many different agencies, and Project Safe Neighborhood, in my opinion, was one of the biggest and best programs we had here in the city. Because back when it began, I believe back in 2006, and it was in different uh, urban communities also here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, what it was was people sitting at the table. It was people from probation, from parole, from the DA's office, the Department of Justice, the U.S. Attorney's Office, ATF, DEA, FBI, state police, local police, talking about the individuals who are committing the vast majority of the crime and what could be done to get them off the street. Because even though, you know, we're talking about a very small portion of the community commits these crimes, they are and continue to be a real and present danger. And by focusing on those individuals, they need to be removed to make sure that that, that, that happens. And by working together and sharing that information, I think it makes a difference and continues to make a difference. Just this summer, I think if you've noticed, has been, there was uh, some shootings uh, a couple months back, and when uh, the, the state police sent the significant resources working with the Brockton police, when a couple of individuals were removed from the street, there was an incredible lull for a period of time during that time period. But what invariably happens, and what's happened over the years, even when there's a lull, other people will step in. And that's why, by working together and sharing this information, it makes incredibly uh, a, a big difference and what's going to occur. Uh, just, you know, back at that same time, those same two individuals, uh, you know, we believe that they were in, the individual was shooting at state police uh, officers here in the city of Brockton. And that just can't happen. We cannot be in a position where we allow individuals to be in the city to have firearms, uh, usually illegally. They're not from Massachusetts. They're brought here from outside the state. They're purchased from outside the state. They're brought into the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and they're being used here in crimes. And we can't allow them to, uh, to really be very uh, bold and brazen, which is what has been going on. Uh, shots uh, in the middle of the day, that, that to me just shows a level of brazenness that cannot be tolerated, and which is why it's incredibly important to make sure that we continue to work together. And when you're dealing with some of the urban issues that occur here, if you recall back, back in 2010, there were a significant number of shootings. It was, unfortunately, there were actually nine homicides in the city that year, uh, and a lot of them occurred on or about the same time. And in trying to resolve those issues and dealing with individuals, that people aren't talking. People don't relatively come, come up to you and tell you, I saw John Doe do this. So you have to work together, and that's why it's really important to use you know, every tool in the toolbox, making sure that we use that information that we have and we put ourselves in a position that we're going to be able to get the information and continue to do the good job that these people are doing. You know, we've had this year in the city of Brockton six homicides. Three of them have been cleared so far. There's three that, once again, continue to be working. That doesn't happen overnight. Many times these cases are only going to be solved with a lot of hard work by the agencies that are up here, by the state police, by the Brockton police, by the federal agencies working together and sharing information. That's really the only way that that's going to occur, to make sure that we can do all the different things that occur. And, you know, we have, you know, some of the troopers here today that have taken off a significant number in conjunction with the Brockton police. Since May 15th, there's been um, 47 arrests and 11 guns taken off by the state police gang unit, as well as 384 grams of heroin, 45 grams of cocaine, and almost five and a half pounds of marijuana. And make no mistake about it, marijuana, which is coming our way, and that's a whole different crisis, as we know, we're in the middle of the opiate crisis right now and all the fatal uh, unattended deaths that are going on. 
make no mistake about it, marijuana is by far the most expensive drug on the street, which makes it very susceptible to people trying to rip each other off, and that makes it incredibly dangerous. Um, one of the other things that we've been trying to do for a number of years is, you know, how can we get more police officers here to the city of Brockton? And I think in counting the numbers that we have of state troopers, at any given time when you have uh, the 25 troopers assigned to the DA's office, uh, the, I think it's five or six individuals from uh, Tony Thomas's CAT team that show up, the gang unit that's here, the violent fugitive apprehension team that's here. That's great that they're here to supplement the Brockton police to make sure that we have people on the street. And we're lucky also, you know, the, the sheriff's been great in trying to make sure we can continue to get resources here. One thing that, that we've been trying to do, never mind the fact that we, you know, we've now turned Operation uh, Project Safe Neighborhood now has been kind of redefined into Safe Streets. The Safe Streets project is going to be, once again, it's going to be the meeting of law enforcement as well as with a community monthly meeting that's going to be back here at the Iron Owen School. It'll be uh, kicking off probably in September. Uh, once again, monthly meetings for pe people in the community to come forward and voice their concerns. And I remember back when we did this and we started this many, many years ago, uh, it turned at the outset, it was like this. There were a lot of people here. And a lot of people voice concerns, but as we got as we got better at it and we used information, at some point, many times these meetings turned into people talking to the mayor's office about light bulbs being out in potholes in the street, which is really what you'd rather hear than a lot of the problems that are going on in the city. So we continue to, to work together. We we in the DA's office understand uh, trying to work trying to do that and work together, and um, we're trying also, as you may may know, over the years, we've been trying to get a new location for the district attorney's office. As you know, there's 25 troopers that work for the DA's office, but they're located in Middleborough at the state police barracks. When we get a new place, and I believe, it, and I'm hopeful, we, got, we have to go through our certain processes, but when we get a, a new place, what we're, will be is in the city of Brockton, and where it would also will bring with it will be the 25 state police troopers from Middleborough. That's not taking away anything from all the other resources that are here, but in although the, the troopers that are assigned to my office uh, will not be out patrolling with the Brockton police, they will be here, there will be visibility, there will be presence. It makes a difference to have those guys and gals around in the city, and I think that's what we need to continue to do. Uh, I know that um, in, in, in the mayor was talking about a lot of the preventative things, which I think are also key, and many times when you think of the DA's office, you don't think of a lot of the preventive programs that are out there. We just finished our annual D.A.R.E. camp last week, more than 600 kids. A lot of kids from Brockton were down there also for a free camp, learning about, once again, the anti-bullying issues, the gang issues, uh, trying to get good in, 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 in classes and awareness, being, making them aware that police officers are their friends and police officers are people they can come out to. The school resource officers do a tremendous job, and the, and the Brockton School Police do a great job over at the school. So th there's certainly lots of things going on, but there's lots of things to continue on doing. And we need to continue to focus on uh, the, the minimum mandatory drug laws. We need to focus on the issues that the police are having, you know, with um, the, 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 the um, new cell phone technology, which is a challenge for, I think, all law enforcement right now, trying to get at the phones. The phones are key in trying to solve lots of cases. And I believe that, you know, with a lot of the information that we have, we'll continue forward and make sure that we can make the steps forward that we can. Nobody, you know, up here, this is, nobody has all the answers. And that's why it's great to see people that are here. Nobody has any crystal balls to make determinations. What's the best thing we can do? All we can do is use our experience and work together and share that information. And in the past, we've shown that when we do that, it does make a difference. And I believe it's going to make a difference again. Thank you, Mr. District Attorney. And I think one of the other reforms we could use, and maybe I don't know if it's legislative, but we have to do something about uh, rental cars because... 75% of the time we're looking for somebody that's driving a rental car and they're swapping them out every day, every week and it's very difficult to get the information from the uh, rental car companies as to who it's currently rented out to and uh, not only does that make the neighborhood more dangerous, it also endangers the lives of the officers that uh, may have to stop the vehicle not knowing who's inside. Um, I, I want to introduce Plymouth County Sheriff Joe McDonald. The, the sheriff has been a um, great partner to the city of Brockton. He's here in the city all the time. Uh, we reach out to him for help on a variety of issues, and uh, he's always here to support the, uh, the Brockton Police Department in any way he can. So I'd like to give him an opportunity to talk about some of the uh, support services he provides, and particularly that uh, 
grant that he obtained for us around fingerprinting technology. So, Joe McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you to uh, Councillor Monahan and Councillor Cruz. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come out here, and I want to thank all of you for coming out to uh, what is a very significant uh, uh, opportunity for us to show you and tell you about some of the things that you have going on. I know that there is a level of unease uh, that uh, I'm hoping that this meeting is going to go a great distance to LA. Uh, some of the things that we do over at the Sheriff's Office, now our primary mission, as everybody knows, is the care and custody of inmates. So we run the Plymouth County Jail and the Plymouth County House of Correction over in Plymouth. But some of the other things that may not be as readily apparent to the public uh, that the mayor alluded to, um, first off is our BCI. And you may see those cruisers here in the city of Brockton. BCI, those initials stand for the Bureau of Criminal Investigation. This is an arm of the sheriff's office that goes back to the 1950s. And you'll see those cruisers around and you'll see us out there processing crime scenes. Um, you may see some of the photographs in the paper of them photographing those shell casings on the ground or uh, lifting fingerprints off of uh, windows, things of that nature. They'll process those things from crime scenes. And uh, surprisingly enough, they are answering about 10,000 calls countywide uh, to process those crime scenes. The mayor uh, referred to the fingerprinting program. Now, that is something that you may have heard of or seen uh, tell of on some of these TV shows. That's APHIS, the Automated Fingerprint Identification System. And I'm very proud to announce, uh, and the mayor previewed it for us, that we are going with a very vastly improved system of APHIS, not just here in Plymouth County and in the city of Brockton, but statewide. Uh, I'm also proud to say that, uh, you know, we're going to be increasing uh, the accuracy of those prints. We are going to be increasing uh, the time that it takes to get those hits to identify who it is that's been involved in this criminal activity, whatever it might be. Uh, but I'm very proud to say that historically here in Plymouth County, we have enjoyed even under the, with the old system, a, uh, the best um, uh, record of solving crimes with the APHIS system of any county in the state. So that's a real credit, not just to our agency, but to the Brockton Police and all of our partners at the state uh, and the local level. The other important thing with reference to our improved uh, fingerprinting system, this is going to be countywide, as I said, not just Brockton, but here as well. We use those fingerprints for a lot of things, not simply to identify people involved in crimes locally, but when we are holding individuals at the jail uh, for various crimes, uh, that information is shared not just uh, with our colleagues at the state level, but also with our federal colleagues. And I don't want to say too much about what they're doing, but things uh, like Immigration and Custom, they have a, a program up now called PEP, Preferred en Enforcement Program. They may talk about that tonight. That deals with identifying not simply uh, illegal aliens, but illegal criminal aliens. And those are people who come here illegally and continue to commit crimes, and very often crimes of violence within our communities. Some other services that we're providing here for the city of Brockton uh, are canine units. Uh, we have canine as perimeter security at the jail, but those canines are always available to our communities, Brockton included, to respond uh, to do searches. Uh, I understand that in the last two weeks, our canine unit has responded three times uh, to uh, firearms incidents here in the city. Uh, they can do searches for those firearms, searches for individuals, searches for drugs. They're very versatile and they're very handy to have. Uh, another service that we provide that isn't necessarily boots on the ground here, uh, but results in increased boots on the ground is the regional lockup. That's a program that we started several years ago when uh, the city of Brockton or any of our communities have an arrest, and maybe that arrest happens on a long weekend or a weekend, Generally speaking, if that individual that's been arrested was not bailable, someone would have to essentially babysit that person while they were held at the police station. And that's significant for several reasons, because not only does that take an officer off the street to perform that babysitting function, you're going to have to pay another officer overtime to go out and to fill that slot, which is probably the most important thing that officers can be doing, is being out there on the street. But it also presents the city of Brockton with... Uh, needless liability. If something were to happen uh, to that individual while in the custody at the police station, which those cells are not designed for long-term uh, holding and the officers aren't trained as our corrections officers for extended periods of time for custody, that will take, will take that individual, will, trans will pick them up, 
transport them back to Plymouth, allowing the Brockton PD to be right where they need to be, which is on the street protecting you folks. So that's been a real important one. The mayor also uh, intimated and mentioned uh, some of our reentry programs. I'm very proud to tell you that we're going to be partnering, partnering with our, our colleagues at the Department of Corrections, that when we have individuals who are serving lengthy state sentences, as they are drawing to a close, those sentences and those inmates are going to be sent down to the Plymouth County Correctional Facility to take advantage of the many great rehabilitative programs and reentry programs. So the people are going to be coming back to the streets of the communities that they left with skill sets and options that hopefully will give them a better uh, chance at, not, uh, at living a legitimate life and not recidivating and coming back to jail. Uh, some of the other things that we do, um, the warrant sweeps, whenever you guys have a major operation over here in the city of Brockton, uh, we see our federal partners, we see the state police, we see the Brockton police, all working together. And one of the things that you may uh, not necessarily see, uh, if you're not right there looking, is we're providing transport services and custodial services. So as those individuals are arrested, booked, and held, if they're not bailed, we'll be transporting them back to the House of Correction over in Plymouth so that the Brockton police do not have to babysit those individuals. Um, I will also um, mention, um, trying to cover all my notes here. We have also borrowed from our colleagues at the Department of Correction a system of inner perimeter security, what we call an IPS team. And what the IPS team is, and this is significant in many, many ways. Department of Corrections has been doing it for a lot of years. We've been doing it for about the last four years. But what the IPS are, are essentially the police officers of the jail. And their job is to generate intelligence. Because believe it or not, the population that's being held is very oftentimes uh, the repository and the, uh, the library of knowledge of what many of the bad things that are going on out in the street. So the intel that we're able to gather uh, from the individuals who are currently residing in the House of Correction is shared with our partners on a regular basis. And uh, all of these things that the Sheriff's Office is doing, uh, I think really do uh, quite a bit to multiply to, uh, we're, we're a force multiplier, the military would call it, to the Brockton PD. So my hat is off uh, to Mayor Carpenter and to Chief Crowley uh, for assembling the coalition that they have assembled uh, to bring a lot of, of pressure to bear against the bad guys. We, uh, we're doing a lot of things, many of which you may not see or be aware of, and uh, I think it's good that we're able to come here tonight and let you know some of these things that are going on. I look forward to uh, any of the questions that you might have or suggestions that... Uh, uh, you might have, and I appreciate uh, the ability to come and to address you tonight. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Sheriff. So at this time, I'd like to give you an opportunity to hear directly from uh, our Brockton Police Chief, uh, John Crowley. And I guess we'll, as we keep going through the panel, we'll try not to repeat too much about topics that have already been covered. But I think, uh, Chief, I'd be especially interested in your perspective leading the Brockton Police Department of some of these issues that we've talked about. Good evening and thank you for coming. Um, as he said earlier, the Brockton Police Officers, we're out there every day. Um, the people that have scanners know how busy we are. The radio doesn't stop. The Brockton Officers are out there along with our state, federal and county law enforcement partners out there every single day and fighting the fight. It's unfortunate what happens the gun violence is awful. We all, I live here, you live here. None of us want it. And history has shown us that it's usually a small amount of people that are doing this. And part of our challenge as police officers is to identify who they are. And that's where we need your help. If someone sees something, say something. We have officers Healy and Lieberg here um, to present some material to you on how to get us these tips. Yeah, they're gonna, they can actually hand them out right now. And there are ways to anonymously give us information. or any, any, It's going to give you every single way you can get us information because that's what we need, and that's how we're going to solve these things. So the last rash we had a month and a half ago or so, it was tips from these anonymous tip lines that gave us the information that we needed. I mean, until we can identify who they are, it's hard for us to catch them. I mean, we have people that we suspect, but we have to catch them doing it. And you know, we're watching people, we're waiting for them to make mistakes, 
but we need help. Um, there's no secret. We're, uh, there's no magic science to this, a magic bullet. We need help. We're out there every day. And together as a community, we're going to come together and we're going to solve this. And we're going to move on and it's going to be a better and safer place. Um, he touched on shot spotter. Uh, the technology, the council approved it. The, the mayor pushed for it. We're going to go from one square mile to five square miles. It's going to tell us where these shots are. Shortly, you're going to get a demonstration. Um, but it's going to help us because oftentimes in the middle of the night, if there's a gunshot, it sounds like it's right next to you, but it's two miles away. Everybody's calling. We got cruises going everywhere but where they should be. Shot spot is going to put us right there to that address. And if there's a cruiser in that area, he's going to be right there. And they're going to have the monitors in their cruisers. So when that call comes in, they're going to be able to go. There's not going to be the lag of dispatch time. Um, I don't want to steal her thunder, but she's, Doris is going to talk about that soon. And I just wanted to emphasize the importance of it. Um, if we can get there, we can make arrests, we can get these people off the street, and we won't have to chase them anymore. And um, I just want to thank you for coming tonight. So perhaps uh, we have a person here from ShotSpotter. This is really topical because not have we just uh, experienced a number of recent incidents of gunfire, uh, but also, and I want to make sure I thank uh, the City Council for their support, uh, but, but uh, we have allocated some money to invest in ShotSpotter, which is gunshot detection technology. There was a very small pilot program of it here rolled out in the city about eight years ago. Um, since that time, it was a very small one square mile area, and over the eight years, I think some of the receivers don't work anymore. The technology has been updated numerous times over those years, and uh, you know what we had was just about obsolete. So by bringing in the new, uh, the new uh, shot spotter system uh, with the technology covering five times the area, five square miles, uh, we feel this is going to be uh, a tremendous tool to our police officers in responding uh, to the report of gunfire. So Doris, can we uh, set up, this is just maybe about five minutes or so so that you can see what Shot Spotter is all about. And part of the reason this is so topical is we begin installing Shot Spotter tomorrow. So there's going to be technicians installing Shot Spotter tomorrow. This is not something way off into the future and it should be up and operational in about 30 days or so. Yep, so we're going to bring the screen down for just a minute so you can get a quick presentation on ShotSpotter and how it works. Good evening, everyone. I'm Doris Cohen from ShotSpotter, and I'm glad to come out this evening and spend some time with you. I actually, prior to going to ShotSpotter, I worked in law enforcement for 15 years. Uh, most of those years as a crime analyst and a gang analyst, and I worked for the city of East Palo Alto many of those years, which is also a city that I grew up in. So I'm glad to see the folks out here because I grew up in the city of East Palo Alto. That was a city that was plagued with a lot of gunfire. Actually, we were uh, murder capital in 1992. And so that's what kind of started ShotSpotter off with introducing this type of solution to law enforcement agencies. So it's, I'm glad to see it now nearly 20 years later, where shot spotters working in a lot of cities. So I'm glad that the city of, of Brockton is using it. You've been using it for a while. You've had some great successes, and I'm glad to see that you're going to continue with the expansion and perhaps have many more successes with arrests, with getting guns off the street, collecting evidence, shell casings, and really getting to the scene, as many people have mentioned, in time prior to or within a minute of the actual gunfire happening and perhaps with a lot of the intelligence that we provide, you'll be able to also get to certain areas and be active in areas where gunfire may occur, so doing more of the proactive type of policing. So let me just tell you a little bit about how ShotSpotter works, the solution. I think I'm ready here. What we provide really is ground truth. This is intelligence. Our technology, our solution is built off of a lot of 
math, a lot of uh, a lot of algorithms and formulas that provide information that allow you, allows the police department rather, to get to the location within a short time, seconds of an incident occurring. So you'll see in any given city, you may find that there are people who may call the police department, they call, they say something occurred, they may not be able to provide a lot of information about what happened because they either don't know the address, they're not sure about the time, they might have called several minutes after the incident occurred. What we do actually is we provide within 60 seconds, sometimes even sooner, 20 to 30 seconds at times, we can tell the police department where the gunfire occurred, providing usually an address, a latitude, longitude, the number of rounds of the incident, and we'll also even provide at times the direction of travel as well as the speed. So that type of information is readily available to the police department as was mentioned in their cruisers and their vehicles, as well as to the dispatch center. Because people don't always call the police department, you may see that in a given city, you would see that there are incidents spread out where people have called and said there's gunshot that occurred in my city. I know this happened for me in the city that I lived in and worked in. We had in one given year, we had 500 incidents that were reported before shot spotter. After shot spotter, we found that there were a lot more incidents to the tune of four times the amount. So you're talking about 2,000 incidents. So 1,500 of those incidents go unreported for a variety of different reasons. So we provide those other incidents that don't get reported by the community. Here's how the system works. We put sensors in specific parts of the city. Those sensors are listening. They're listening for gunfire. Once they hear gunfire, that is what gets alerted to the police department. We have a group of people, aside from the technology itself, that actually sit in a room providing information about these gunshot incidents, and they report that information to the police department. And this happens 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'll show you a quick video on how that works. Sorry, of course this worked in the original part. But <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. It's okay. Here we go. Hi, my name is Jamie Hopkins. I am the manager here at the SFP Incident Review Center. Today, I'd like to show you what we do when a gunshot incident comes through your city. So come with me. A lot of times people will ask me, how do you know if something is a gunshot? Well, I'd like to show you. The first thing that happens when a live incident comes through is that the reviewers get an alert on their screen. When the data download flows into our system, we first look at the waveform pattern. This is a plastic waveform pattern for a gunshot, and these are where all the senses are indicated. And once I play it, you will hear that it is gunshot. The other piece of information that helps us is the sensor pattern, which is located right here. This shows a directional pattern. It occurs on one side of the incident versus the other, and that tells us where most of the sensors were activated. There are some times when we provide more information for the police officers. In a lot of cases, when dispatchers receive 911 calls, they may or may not have all the information that they need. So I like to show you a case where we have possible multiple shooters. You can hear very clearly that there are two shooters, and we provide that information to dispatchers to pass on to their officers as they respond. We are here at the SFT IRP 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. 
When you have an incident that may or may not have shown up in your system, let us know within 72 hours and we can download sensitive information and provide that to you if we've captured it. That's the sound. That's the sound that is usually heard in the police department when a gunshot incident is detected. And there are the specifics about the location. You can see that there's a map. It shows where at the location it occurred. So we'll provide additional information such as the front of the house, the side of the house, the side of the building. So that way when the officer arrives at the location, whether it be a big, you know, apartment complex or a business, they know exactly where to start looking for evidence, a shooter, a gun, anything that may be at that location. So those specifics are provided to the department. We also provide departments with information about gunfire, the number of incidents that have occurred, whether or not they've had peaks, highs and lows, increases or decreases in gunfire based off the data. And then we also provide additional resources to the departments. We're really here to partner with the departments. We're here for them. Uh, we, uh, we go to court on cases when those cases make it to court to talk about our solution and how it works. And we provide all of the, the mapping, the, the uh, audio, and any other information about the gunfire. That's really what we do for the cities. We are continuously looking for ways to partner with you. We've seen great successes here in Brockton and other places in Massachusetts. We actually have several customers here. We have about 100 installations throughout the United States, and we're also working on other efforts. We're working with Kruger National Park. We're doing some work with the rhino, you know, the sale of the, the ivory. And so we're really looking to, for ways to continue to partner with your agency as well as throughout the United States and beyond. So thank you. While they're putting that away, I just wanted to, a couple of other elected officials came in since we started, uh, state rep and city council still, Michelle Dubois. I see Councilor Lodge Bob Sullivan in the back. Uh, Councilor Paul Sedensky, former police chief, was there. I don't know where he is now. And I believe I saw Councilor Shirley Azak and Councilor, uh, Councilor Barnes. Shana Barnes is in the back, too. Oh, and Councilor Moses Rodriguez is here, too. And now I'll turn it back over to the mayor. Thank you, Tim. Scott, it might be uh, in, in the light of that presentation, I think you can see why this is uh, so important to us in responding uh, to the use of illegal crime guns in the city. But I thought we have uh, Ken LeGrice with us, Lieutenant of the Brockton Police Department and Chief of our Detective Bureau. And Lieutenant, I thought you might just be able to give us a little bit of quick insight as to what this technology will mean or what this data their performance standard in our contract is that at least 80% of the time they get that exact location of the gunfire to us in less than 30 seconds. Less than 30 seconds, 80% of the time. And I thought, uh, Lieutenant, if you could just compare and contrast that as to how we typically respond to a, a report of a gunshot right now. The advantage of uh, using something like ShotSpotter here in the city is that uh, Brockton is not area-wise a very big city. Anything you can do to cut down on response time increases that chance of catching somebody at the scene or anything like that. So just think of it simply like this. A lot of this gunfire that we're experiencing recently is no longer fixed. It's going from car to car, and it's vehicles that are passing each other. At 30 miles an hour, a car, car uh, travels at approximately 44 feet per second. Figure it out. If it takes us four minutes to get that call, that car's already traveled over a mile, mile and a half in some area that we don't know it went. We cut that down to 30 seconds. It cuts a lot of time off of where that vehicle might have traveled. So it gives us a better chance of finding it. The other thing that it's allowed us to do is that we are now, it's unfortunate and fortunate. It's unfortunate that we have to recover shell casings, but it's fortunate in the fact that um, we have other technology that we've par partnered with the ATF on and, and the state police, and we're analyzing shell casings. 
Um, we're using this, and I don't mind saying it, as a uh, tool to try and tie these things together. This will all help us make a case when it all comes together. Um, and the ATF has been a great help in that to us, as well as um, the DA's office and the state police assigned to them. These are some of the things that go on behind the scenes that you folks don't see, but believe me, we take take this very seriously, and the uh, men and women in the Brockton Police Department are working hard for you. I, I know from your standpoint, it may appear like it, it's just constant, but uh, believe me, we had some uh, luck two months ago, and as the mayor and the chief had talked about, our crime, our shot, shots dropped off the radar screen. It's, it's come alive again in the last couple of weeks. We are on it, and we're working towards doing the same thing we did in the last case, which is arresting the people involved and, and seeing it go away again. So, but this time, let me explain one more thing. This happened. This actually happened in the city of Brockton. Nobody called us for gunshots, and a day later, somebody found shell casings outside their home. So we responded and we recovered the shell casings. In the exact words of the homeowner, were, "Oh, I thought shot spot would have shot spotter would have told you where they were." Well. That area of the city was not covered by shot spotter. You folks have an obligation to get, pick up the phone as soon as possible. Don't assume that somebody else is going to call us or that shot spotter is going to call us. Whenever there's a crime, no matter what it is, you need to pick up the phone and call us as soon as possible. The sooner we get that information, the sooner we get to the scene. And believe me, we, we take pride in the job that we do in solving these crimes. But again, as, as you've heard from this panel, We've put together a team of people that can solve it. We need your help in, in, uh, in getting some of that information to us. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. So it, why don't we, uh, I think it would be logical to uh, give each of our federal partners a chance to briefly describe their work in the city. And I think the, the natural segue here would be to ATF. And we're uh, fortunate to have supervisory special agent uh, Ross Marchetti from ATF here tonight. Hey, good evening, thank you. Uh, my name is Ross Marchetti. I'm a supervisory special agent with ATF. I actually supervise our Crime Gun Intelligence Center, which is out of the Boston Field Division in Boston. I've uh, been up there for a little over a year, and prior to that, I was uh, working here in, in Brockton through our Bridgewater Field Office. Uh, so the ATF has a couple components and a couple ways that, that we're assisting the city. Uh, the first is the efforts of the field office out of Bridgewater, um, agents that are assigned uh, to work uh, in partnership with the state police and, and Brockton Police Department. Um, and then secondly is our, our force multiplier, uh, task force officers that we have deputized uh, with the state police uh, and with the, the police department that, that do a fantastic job uh, day in and day out. Uh, aside from the, the proactive efforts of the field office and, and the agents here, uh, our group, the intelligence group at the Crime Gun Center in Boston, uh, works to um, analyze the information that comes from these recoveries of crime guns or recoveries from ballistic information. We've dedicated uh, an intelligence research specialist uh, to the city, as well as one of our special agent intelligence officers. Uh, to compile the information from recovered firearms, from casings, uh, any other intelligence that we can gather through the state police, through the police department, uh, and our partnership with the sheriff's office as well. Uh, and our job is, is to try and look at the, the big picture, our job in intel. Uh, so we're bringing that information back. We're trying to analyze it. Uh, we will expect to partner once the police department brings on their uh, criminal analyst uh, and, and attack this from, from both angles, both the, the proactive efforts of, of uh, law enforcement as well as the, the big picture efforts that we're conducting with our intelligence units. Thank you. Thank you, Agent Marchetti. We uh, would like to uh, have uh, Kevin White, uh, special agent from the FBI, say a few words. I do want to mention, because many of you may not realize this, that with the Brockton PD, we have a full-time detective, a detective assigned on a full-time basis to working with the FBI. So that's how strong the relationship is. That's what their presence is here in the city. 
that we actually have one of our detectives assigned to working with the FBI on a full-time basis. So, Mr. White. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for stealing my thunder, too. So uh, I was going to mention Detective Joe Cummings. He is with us full-time. He has uh, the same clearance as any FBI agent would across the country. He has full access to all of our databases, and uh, he works a million hours a week. He's a great partner. Um, for those that don't know, we have a, uh, we have a full-time office here in Brockton. It's an off-site, and it's comprised of uh, FBI agent, the state police, Brockton PD. They work very closely together. A lot of information sharing goes on there. Um, our goal with the FBI here, working with Brockton PD and the state, is we target the worst of the worst. Um, we try to hit the most violent neighborhoods where we've seen the most violence and gun activity. Our, what we bring to the table, like Sheriff McDonald said, is a big toolbox. The FBI does have access. We have resources to some additional tools that uh, maybe the state or, or the local PDs wouldn't have. Um, we've had a wiretap here, which prevented a murder. Right, Greg? Uh, one of the agents that works here full-time, Greg Federico, um, for the folks that don't know Greg, he's very dedicated to Brockton. Uh, Greg and I were on the Cape this morning at, at 5 a.m. at a child pornography search warrant. And Greg didn't have to be here tonight, but he, he's here tonight, and he's, he's fully dedicated to the team. Um, Mike McCarthy, Mike was shot at a few weeks ago. What you guys don't know is uh, this task force here, it's the best of the best. It's not easy to get on it's the state police task force or Brockton PD or the FBI. These are the best of the best. So, you know, this isn't, these aren't a, a bunch of rookies. These are the most talented police officers we have in the state. And Greg's worked gangs in Norfolk, Virginia. I've got gang uh, experience in Washington, D.C. and Miami. So I like to think that we bring a lot to Brockton. Uh, the office we have here is it's an off-site. The guys work in there day in, day out. We have um, our goal here is to, is to disrupt and dismantle the violent gangs here. Um, not all of the arrests will lead to federal charges. We know that. But Mike and Greg and, and Captain Wilmington, they'll discuss the different arrests. And if we can apply a federal law, to it and get this individual more time in federal prison, then we will do that with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston. I'm in constant contact with uh, Kenny LeGrice from Brockton PD, good friend, great worker for you guys. I can't say enough about him. Um, I want to let you know that Greg Federico has also spoken to schools here in Brockton, so we're not just out at night working. Uh, Greg takes an active role in speaking to the students here in, uh, in Brockton as well. Um, it's already been said a hundred times about the cooperation. I won't go down that road again. It is very important. Um, Captain Wilmington with the state police at the DA's office, he, he spends more time in Brockton, I think, than at his, at his own house. And he will be the first one to tell you that every little piece of information helps. You may think it's insignificant in a shooting or a murder, but trust me, every piece helps. Um, one thing I want to mention, which most of you probably don't realize, is that um, Scott and I, we talk a lot. And the FBI lab at Quantico, Virginia, there have been several uh, murders, shootings here, right, Scott, where he's like, hey, Kevin, uh, our guys didn't have any luck with this. Can you help us out? So we've enhanced video, audio. Um, a recent success story would be the burnt phone. And, uh, a murder suspect tried to destroy a cell phone. We had some technology available. Scott called me. Just like that, cell phone to cell phone. I think we had it at Quantico the next business day. We put a rush on it, and they got some good information. So. These are things that, don't make, that does not make the newspaper or the media, but uh, I just want to let you know that, that we are here. We work closely with the ATF. Ross and I, uh, good buddies, Ross, uh, DEA. I don't think DEA is here tonight. I can assure you I've had recent conversations with the supervisor, Bob Barrett. They've got some sophisticated techniques going on. We'll, we, we will be working with them as well on a, uh, a drug case involving uh, human trafficking. So we're in the city. You may not see us all the time. I just want to stress that... Uh, that were dedicated um, violent gangs for the FBI is as high a priority as, a, as terrorism, as ISIS. That's what we see on the news every night. My belief, uh, and I think you'll agree here, is more people are killed in gang violence every year than terrorism. So it's a high priority for Director Comey. That priority is not going away. The resources aren't going away. Um, and I want to just mention, uh, Chief Crowley had a great quote. He said, the good people outnumber the bad. It's a great crowd here tonight. Um, it's awful what's going on in the city, but you guys are lucky. We've seen what's happened in Baltimore. I can just tell you, speaking with Chief Crowley, Lieutenant LeGrice, Captain Wilmington, Mike McCarthy, these guys work all night, all hours, holidays, weekends, July 4th, when you're having a good time. These guys are working, so please keep that in mind. You've got a very dedicated group of folks here, and um, you know, hopefully we can get, get this violence down. 
Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Gallagher. I'm the field office director for Immigration Customs Enforcement uh, here in New England. Uh, my area of operational responsibility includes all the six states of New England. Uh, and I have staff members uh, across all the six states uh, and many that work uh, in the state of Massachusetts, including the city of Brockton. Um, I guess it would, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to, to know the, the FBI and ATF and and everybody else does, but a lot of people really don't know what ICE does. Um, ICE enforces over 400 federal laws related to uh, immigration, border control, uh, customs, and trade. Um, and the component of ICE that I manage is responsible really for uh, addressing the immigration-related uh, issues. Um, and, and, and you're probably wondering how or why is that important to the city of Brockton, um, but I think it would be important you can draw that nexus when you understand what we do. Um, we're responsible for uh, identifying, locating, and arresting uh, those aliens or foreign-born individuals uh, that pose a threat to national security, public safety, and those who undermine the, the legal immigration system or thwart our border control efforts However, the primary focus uh, for us really is public safety and national security. Um, uh, in the United States, uh, we have a significant uh, foreign-born population, obviously. Um, the majority of those who uh, reside in this country are legal and law-abiding citizens. Uh, however, there is a criminal element that lives within um, our neighborhoods, and ICE is really responsible for uh, identifying those folks, arresting them, and removing them from the country. Um, you can send folks to jail, and uh, you know some of them come out, they commit crimes again, but if you can arrest somebody and remove them to their country of origin, uh, it has a significant impact on public safety. Um, well, the sheriff mentioned one of our programs, the priority enforcement programs, um, the, it's a great nexus that we drew with uh, increasing technologies, better technologies. Uh, under the, this current program, when uh, a law enforcement entity arrests somebody uh, and their fingerprints are sent to the FBI to see if there's open warrants, uh, criminal history, they're also compared against the Department of Homeland Security uh, information systems. And if there is a match and it's somebody that is uh, within one of our enforcement priorities, one of my officers, uh, we'll uh, work with state and local partners to uh, ultimately arrest that individual, place them into proceedings before a judge, and then uh, essentially they're deported. Um, we work very closely uh, with our law enforcement partners at the federal, state, county, uh, local, and tribal levels. Um, we assist um, on many of the task forces that were mentioned here tonight, um, and we all share a passion really as you do, because it's obvious that you're here, and that's for public safety. Um, you also play a significant role uh, in community safety, and what I'm asking you to do, because we do rely on tips from the community, is if that you have a foreign-born individual who's riding, uh, residing within your community that you know is committing crimes, um, is to give us a call. Uh, you can either go to the ICE.gov website, and there's a, uh, a tip line phone number. I can give it to you tonight. It's 1-866-347-2423. Uh, um, we've had some significant successes um, from the tip line, arresting foreign-born individuals that um, appear to be law-abiding citizens here in the United States, but they're wanted for some pretty egregious crimes overseas. Uh, murder, um, we've had a few um, wanted murders that we've arrested um, within the communities uh, here in, in Massachusetts. Um, it seems to be uh, a, a place of choice for many to hide uh, from certain countries. So um, we work, again, closely um, with the local the, the police departments to try and, and increase your community safety. So I just want to say uh, thank you uh, for giving this opportunity to address you 
uh, and again to thank our, our uh, local partners for assisting us in executing those duties. Thank you. So uh, before we go to the questions, I just want to reiterate, you know, on behalf of all the residents of the city, how much we appreciate the assistance uh, that we are receiving from all these various agencies you've heard from here tonight. And I think the key um, theme that you heard over and over is that they're all here to support the Brockton Police Department and that the Brockton Police Department has a great working relationship with all of these agencies because we're all striving to do the same thing and that's get dangerous individuals off the streets of our city. So having said that, Tim, I'll shut my microphone off for a moment and uh, turn it over to you. Mr. Mayor, there we go. Uh, th that's a lot of great information that I think a lot of us do not have, and I personally want to thank all of these gentlemen for being here tonight. Again, some of your local elected officials but a lot of these gentlemen don't have to be here, and uh, they've taken the time out of their schedules and 4 o'clock this morning to be down the Cape. That should be going to the beach, not for doing that kind of work. So, uh, A lot of people have come in since we uh, started the meeting. Just want to kind of go through some ground rules. As I said before, this is not a campaign event for anybody. I'm going to allow people to, to ask a question or make a suggestion. Please keep it to one minute or less. And please keep it to what we're here to talk about, which is specifically the, the violence in the city and the gun violence in particular. So uh, if people want to line up here, and by the way, because we have a little mess up that only one microphone can be on at, the t at a time, I'll be holding the microphone, and, uh, and then we'll allow whoever you, and if you don't remember the name of somebody, just, uh, just point and we'll let them know. So uh, if you want to identify yourself, you can, and then you can ask your question. My name is Ed, and I'm a Brockton resident for a long time now, and I have a question for the police department. Um, uh, we know that the, that the detectives are doing the best job that they can do in the districts or the regions that, they, that they're in. We also know that the criminals here are very smart. So my question is, is it possible for the detectives, after they have canvassed an area, to meet in, a, in a, a predisposed area and switch cars with another set of detectives so when they go back to the same area, the criminals don't know that they're the same people that they saw early and go, there's the police, there's the police, there's the police. Um, it just seems to make more sense to be able to do that. Thank you. Chief uh, Kenny? I'll just add, um, as you said, the criminals are dumb. They're smart. So we'll only use those cars once and then they're going to know us. I mean, it's unfortunate, but that's where the times we have. We, we don't have the resources to be able to replace vehicles that fast. In a perfect world, we would, but unfortunately, we're not there. Um, Lieutenant LaGrange, you want to add anything else? Just that along those lines, we do rotate our vehicles often, not on a daily basis on a situation like that, but um, enough that um, we keep them off guard but they do get rota rotated quite often. That I spoke with the mayor and we talked about the coffee with a cop thing, and um, it seems to be that that is something that is happening, and I want to thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you want to identify yourself and ask you a question. Yes, my name is Edward Downey. Uh, you did say comment also. Yeah, you yeah. Comment as long as you keep I, yes, I will. I would just like to say I'm happy that we're here tonight to discuss this. The shootings and things that's going on is really uh, unbelievable. But I would like to recommend that if it were possible for the police department to possibly establish a kind of a meeting like this, where police officers can communicate with the citizens of the community, because there are some issues going on in Brockton. Uh, between police officers and the city that I believe might also contribute to shootings and other things. And I think if we could get together and have a kind of a forum like this and open to things, race relations and otherwise, I think that would be important. Thank you. Uh, Chief, if you want to... I could just make a... Is yours off? There we go. Just a quick comment. We actually... Uh, 
met with some top officials of Boston PD recently to look at some models that they have in terms of uh, community communication. And we are meeting with some different folks around the city right now. So our goal is to put together a panel that would represent a cross-section of both clergy and the various communities within the city that would uh, have a direct line of communication uh, with the police department. So that's a, a little bit more formalized, but I think along the same uh, lines that you're talking, and that's uh, something that we're actively talking about. And also, um, like I said, this Operation Safe Streets is going to be kicking up their community meetings next month. It'll be publicized, so anybody can come to that. Any concerns that they have, I think there'll be members and representatives from a lot of these agencies, as well as the Brockton Police, and uh, I think you have you can answer your questions. If you make sure we get your name before you leave, I'll make sure the DA's office has your name to notify you of the Safe Streets meetings. Uh, thank you. Ozzy Jordan, uh, three quick things. Uh, we were here, actually it's going to be four, we were here four years ago talking about this stuff and fortunately we're here with the same issues again. You're talking about meetings in the city. It should be done by ward, come ward captains, award something out of that. We need to reestablish the crime watch the way we had it. We had a couple of people that were pushing it because they were the individuals who were in it. Unfortunately they're no longer with us. That's usually what happens. You've got a person that pushes something. They leave. It dies. These are the top guys. Thank you for here. We need your guys that are on the street to be at the ward places because we know you won't be there. <laughs> Just the way it works. You cover the region. You can't do it. So, but thank you. Last thing is this. Four years ago, we used a little bit of the Boston mod, uh, model. What we did was what they were doing. Anybody out there was doing something wrong. A little facetious, spitting on the street, swearing, whatever they were doing, three times, fourth time they can go away. That was something that worked, cleaned up our streets well. One last suggestion, and I've seen this every year. This time of year, a lot of crime. During the winter, crime's down. We know the reasons why. One of the things, maybe, you can get together with corrections and see if it's possible to maybe release some of our characters after the summer, when it's cold again, and they don't want to be on the street, they want to come out early in the spring so they can be out here. When they get out here, then they want to take over what they left. If we could keep them in past that, maybe that would help some of what's going on. Try it. Thank you. Well, I don't know if we get to make that call, Ozzy. <laughs> maybe we'll just lock them up, throw away the key. That would be good in some cases. Hold on. Just a quick follow-up to one of Ozzy's uh, many comments, and that is uh, regarding Neighborhood Watch. We have reinvigorated Neighborhood Watch. We're building both Neighborhood Associations and Neighborhood Watch. We've started half a dozen of them this year. Um, so Officer Bill Healy is right over here. If, if Officer, Healy, uh, Officer Healy oversees that for the uh, police department. So if there is anyone here tonight that's interested in starting a, uh, a neighborhood watch group in your neighborhood, I strongly suggest it. I, I was out at a block party last Saturday, and based upon a conversation with the neighbors, uh, we're now setting up a neighborhood meeting with Officer Healy uh, to explain how they can uh, get a neighborhood watch going in their neighborhood. So, you know, we do have to fight this fight street by street, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, we need the help of the residents in that neighborhood and a neighborhood watch group is the best way to do it. So uh, we hope if you're here and you don't have a watch group in your neighborhood, please see Officer Healy before you leave. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In fact, I was going to mention that for any of you that don't have an active neighborhood watch, it is the best way to get to know your neighbors. It not only makes it a safer place, it makes your neighborhood a much more enjoyable place to live. I've overseen some groups that didn't had an issue in the neighborhood. They called and I helped with a meeting and oftentimes they didn't even know their neighbors. Once you get to know your neighbors, it's amazing. I've got in, in Ward 1 three or four very active groups and they become great friends and with block parties and all, but it's the, it's the single safest way, best way to keep your neighborhood safe. And I would just contact your ward counselor who can set it up 
with Officer Healy to set up a meeting, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. James Swain, Peace Patrol. Um, a couple of couple of things I wanted to uh, address, and then one statement I had to make. Uh, first of all, I believe that Brockton is really working hard to address the criminal element here in the city, but um, and I definitely applaud that effort. Uh, some of you here know me and know that I'm very active in the community as well, trying to establish programs to work with the police and law enforcement to take our streets back. My concern, however, and probably the concern of many of the people here is that once we get them off the streets, for example, we've seen a number of large raids here lately. Great tactics in there, hitting everybody all at once. I believe we had like 28 were taken off the streets a couple of weeks ago, but unfortunately by the end of the day, 26 of them were back on the streets. How are we addressing this? That's probably going to be the DA that's going to express our frustration on that one. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, no, it is frustrating because when individuals get arrested, they get brought to court and they have an arraignment over there in front of a judge and the district attorney's office will make a, a request for bail and usually they'll have an attorney and that person will make a request for bail and the judge will make a determination. Lots of those individuals are arrested back at the end part of June, which was that sweep that we do every year and have been doing, I think, for probably the last decade or so. Uh, a lot of those individuals were picked up on warrant management cases, some on lower level drug dealing cases. And as a result of that, in the volume of cases going through district court, we make our recommendations. And I think the judges, most of the judges do a good job, uh, but sometimes we don't certainly agree with them and they put them right back out on the street. And it's very frustrating, not just for us, but I think for the police and for law enforcement as well. So we continue to ask for our bail, make sure that we can put the request out there based upon somebody's background, their history, and the judge will make the determination. Any name? Thanks. Ed Conley, former TWU Vice President. I want to thank our panel for coming. It's a fine representation of uh, law enforcement. But I've got a real, Neil say I'm pro-labor, and I'm looking for those 50 cops that are supposed to be on our streets that were supposed to be here last year. You were in your platform on that, and I voted because of that. I, it's, I understand it's not a political agenda. However, this is about crime. We expected those 50 cops. And also, I don't see any of our minorities up here being represented at this table. What's up with that? Where are our... our, our our female, our female crime fighters that are in positions or any other minority that represent our city on the table or and or speaking. I just think that's wrong. And I'm a taxpayer and I've got a right to say that. Thanks. Let me let me respond briefly to a couple points the gentleman made. First of all, I never said I was going to hire 50 cops in one year that would cost millions of dollars that we don't have. I said that we would set the goal of adding 50 long term, and we've taken the first step in that this year in a $6 million deficit budget. We are filling every single vacancy on the force. We'll be at full strength for the first time in a long time, plus by filling all the vacancies, we're able to obtain a COPS grant to fund two additional patrol officers. So when that next class comes out that's in the academy right now, we'll be at um, full staffing plus an increase of two. It'll be the highest staffing we've had since the uh, early 90s. On the other question regarding minority representation, I think that it would be, I, I don't control who works for all the agencies, uh, but what I do control is who we hire as, as Brockton police officers. And uh, I think it's very important to note that the class of nine new officers that are at the academy right now, seven out of nine are minorities. And it's the first minority majority police cadet class this city has ever had. So we are very committed to developing and transforming our police department to more accurately resent the community that it serves that is a long-term process that's going to happen over a number of times. However, seven out of nine in this class are minorities, many of which are also bilingual. There, it takes about two seconds for this, Jean. There you go. Jean Holmes. 
Um, I, I know you guys work hard. I'm not saying you don't. But I have to say, the same table sat just down the street in June and promised you were going to get things done. And nothing has changed. It has stayed the same or gotten worse. Now, I understand you're working hard. I'm not suggesting that you're not each and every one of you. Many of you I know personally. Trust me. But what you're doing just isn't working. And you should have seen that in June, that it wasn't working. And you should have come up with another plan and brought it here to these people with a new plan, as opposed to us sitting here and listening to the same story. The only thing that was different was you had the spot shotter or shot spotter video, but that's the only thing that changed. You need to stop using the same old process and following the same old measures of reaction and get to preventive action, creative action, we are under crisis here in this city. We have been, and it has not gotten any better since we had the meeting in June, where you all promised it was going to be done. You were going to work hard, and you were going to address these issues. Nothing has been addressed other than you've now said that you're going to put in more shot spotters. Well, guess what? We want the, sh the, shoots, the shots to stop. We don't want to have to use the shot spotter. We want you to figure out how to stop them from shooting up our, our neighborhoods so you don't need to be chasing bullets on the ground. Thank you, Jean. I think I'll just give a, a quick response in terms of strictly Brockton. I think we did talk about a number of new initiatives. Shot spotter although it's responding to a gunshot, it is a preventative tool because we know we have the same small group of people that are firing their illegal guns over and over. So if we get them this time, they're not around to do it next time. Jacob, you'll get plenty of chances to debate me during the campaign. This isn't the right forum. Hi, I'm Reverend Rachel Tedesco. I'm a community minister at the First Parish Church in Bridgewater, but I'm also a member of the Brockton Interfaith Community. I'm newly elected to the board, uh, appointed by my church. And um, I'm really concerned with what's going on in Brockton. I've lived here. I lived here in the past, and I used to work for the city. Um, and one creative approach that I've heard about recently, I went to a forum on this on restorative justice. And it's been tried and conquered, and in the area, and in the, uh, the juvenile court in Lowell, it's very, very successful. And instead of bringing kids, youth who have been in trouble, uh, you know, maybe once or twice before the court system, they are put into a, a process where they confront the people that they victimized, and they they sit down and talk, and they agree on restorative justice. So it's not punitive oriented, but it's restorative oriented. It really, really works. And um, I could say a lot more, but I will say that Judge Jay Blitzman of the Juvenile Court of Lowell and a professor in criminal justice at Northeastern University highly recommends this process. He said it's a win-win situation for everyone. It's effective in changing behaviors and more cost effective than jails. It has a deeper impact on the youth than just community service and the traditional court model. So I really urge the city of Brockton, the mayor, the city councilors, and the Brockton Police Department to consider instituting this. I will say one more thing. It's used in the Cambridge school system very successfully. It's not kids who have necessarily broken the law, but maybe they've gotten into fights and they have their own mediation system. It's really working very well. Thank you. Yeah, just, no, thank you very much. I just, I, just, I just want to let you know that there has been in the county for many, many years diversionary programs for a, a lot of the youth, and now the way that it works, if a, if a child, a, a juvenile under the age of a certain age is, is arrested or brought to court with a summons or tribal for a crime, what happens is when they're brought to court, if it's a, a lower-level crime, they don't get arraigned in court, and they're given an opportunity to go and do some community service to stay out of trouble if it's drugs or if it's alcohol and make sure that they can try to better their way. And if they successfully complete 
uh, their program, they never get arraigned, so they don't get a quarry, they don't get a criminal record, and it allows them, puts them in a position where they can move on. The diversion program over the years has been incredibly successful. Most of the kids, you never see them again. Kids will be kids, and they'll do something foolish and stupid, and I think that that's what we try to, to expect that. Let's so give it to the sheriff real quick. <clears throat> Thank you, Tim. I just wanted to address uh, quickly, you mentioned restorative justice, and that is something that is uh, something we've been doing as part of our reentry programs. It is uh, an, a very interesting process. It comes to us uh, from Australia, and uh, we've been doing those types of things as the inmates are preparing to leave. We do things like victim impact panels uh, to show them exactly what the impact of that crime has been, and we've seen some, some pretty good results with that. So going forward, as we're partnering with Department of Corrections, stepping those inmates down into the House of Correction before they come back, they will have the opportunity to participate in increased and expanded restorative justice programs. So thank you for mentioning those. Thank you. Reverend, just to let you know that Brockton High does have a peer mediation program. When there's peer-to-peer -peer issues, they do have a peer mediation issue. And my son is one of the peer mediators, and it's a very successful program. I don't know exactly how high a level the the uh, the uh, punishments are, but I'll try and find that out for you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Isabel Lopez. I'm the lead organizer at the Brockton Interfaith Community. I have a couple questions for you all, all at the panel. Uh, my first question is, what neighborhoods you are working, doing community policing, and what are the encountering sessions that you're having with the youth, especially youth of color, of color in the community. You can see in the room, we are missing the young adults. And so what the message, what is the message that you're sending to our communities? At the Brockton Interfaith Community, we are, we are the space for the community to come and speak. And on September 15, we are bringing the city councils together for our community encountering. Right now, we are conducting encountering sessions throughout the city. And that's what, why we're hearing a lot. There is a lack of communication and relationship among all of you and our communities of color. Thank you. Well, thank you. We do certainly appreciate all the great work that BIC does within the city. Um, we have made new commitments to community policing. Uh, we. Uh, just this year, uh, hired a community outreach, is that the right term? Community outreach uh, officer whose full time job is community outreach, uh, a female Cape Verdean officer uh, to work directly in that community. And uh, the chief and I are already forming plans to hire another multilingual community outreach officer in January once we get the new group of officers on the street uh, so that we can do another dedicated special duty. Uh, but uh, even with what we have right now, uh, there have been a number of community outreaches. She's held meetings. Uh, we've got officers walking in the park, officers doing coffee with a cop, um, and also, um, you know, our belief is that every police officer should be a community police officer. It should be a prevailing uh, philosophy amongst all of our police officers but we've certainly made an emphasis with the motorcycle and bicycle officers that they spend time off of the motorcycles and the bikes talking to the community. They are in the parks, they are talking to young people, and they are, uh, they are engaging young people on a daily basis. Thank you, Mr. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, actually, the question that uh, Isabel there asked is kind of what I was going to ask. So. Um, I'm happy to hear your answer. Um, I, uh, my name is Dan Margolis. I work with the Boys and Girls Brigade of Brockton, and we have a, a bunch of kids. And, and I asked them at a recent meeting, you know, how many of you know police officers? What have your interactions with police officers been like? And you know, in a good, uh, the good thing is that none of them have actually had a bad interaction that they mentioned. But the problem was that no one actually knew a police officer. So I'm wondering if that could be a, a goal for the the Brockton Police Department for people to. For, I mean, I guess that's part of the community policing, but to actually have most of the kids in Brockton get to know by name a police officer. Um, and one other question that just kind of came to my mind is, I wonder if there are any new sort of um, uh, preventative things that you 
as a group or individually have been thinking about, you know, for example, there was this thing in Gloucester um, where they, they, they had a, a, a rules change and the new idea is there is that if someone walks into a police station with drugs but they say, I want to be clean, they won't be arrested, they'll be, you know, shown to a treatment program. I wonder if there's any, any ideas like that uh, circling around the, the, the police, uh, the, the crime uh, enforcement community? Anyway, thank you. There you go. It's ironic that you bring up Gloucester because yesterday morning I was in the Gloucester Mayor's office with Lieutenant Linehan of the Brockton Police Department meeting with the Gloucester Chief and the Gloucester Mayor so that we could see firsthand exactly how that initiative worked. You know, we've had, we've established some similar policies here. Um, you know, I think that uh, in overdose and simple possession cases, we're really trying to get people into ambulances, not police cruisers. Um, you know, we really only look to arrest for weight and warrants, somebody that's selling or somebody that has an outstanding warrant. Uh, but you're right, it was a little intriguing to see this new wrinkle that Gloucester has put. Uh, and that's why I spent half a day yesterday going back and forth to Gloucester to take a first-hand look at it. And uh, we're going to be meeting over the next few weeks to see if we can um, model something very similar here. Because I think the commitment by law enforcement in that program is to uh, seek help for individuals that are asking for it. And uh, I've asked for a meeting with some of our community partners, High Point Spectrum, because an important piece of that program is it only works if the police can get the person into treatment somewhere and we have a critical shortage of treatment beds. But uh, we're hoping to get a commitment for some sort of priority for a program like this with a couple of the local treatment centers. Um, and also in terms of uh, student outreach, Officer Leadberg is here. She works in the schools all the time. Uh, she operates, uh, she um, presents our Not My Kid program. Great families. Uh, we have a police youth academy that just started this past year where middle school students are actually attending a police youth academy. We've done two classes now or three. We've just graduated our third class. Uh, I've attended uh, not this most recent graduation, but the one before. I think it's exactly the type of outreach that you're talking about with middle school age students. Um, and also keep in mind, we do have three full-time school resource officers in the middle schools, and they're all very good. And I'd like to have more than three, um, but we do have three outstanding school resource officers in addition to all the work that Officer Liebert does. Uh, I was going to mention our three. There are very few middle school kids in Brockton who haven't met and, and dealt with one of our uh, community resource officers in the school. So that's, uh, most of the kids know them, Mike Clifford and Nancy, and I don't know who the other one is, but the kids know them and they love them. So thank you. Hi, Ellie Wentworth. Thank you for, you'll hold. <laughs> thank you for uh, coming again tonight. It was the June meeting. I thought was very, very encouraging. I learned a lot from it, and I think that you really have stepped up uh, the, all these police chases. People aren't, policemen aren't chasing around in cars, uh, putting their lives at stake, chasing people for the fun of it. And I've seen many more police car chases. How many? Four in the last three days or so. I was actually on Pleasant Street when the one occurred on Monday night, and I'll tell you, it was pretty scary. But I, I said, my God, you know, I'm afraid of somebody running into me or whatever. And then I said, my God, look at all those police officers in those cars that are chasing them, putting their lives on the line. I think we have to be more understanding how difficult a job it is that all of you have. Uh, I think many questions were answered tonight. I think a lot of accusations were brought out that of, uh, and thinking that we don't have all the things that we have in Brockton. I think it was a very positive meeting. My question actually is for Sheriff McDonald, and I wrote it out so I won't forget what to say. Um, this evening's, uh, this afternoon's Enterprise editorial uh, talked about a state uh, committee being formed for the justice, a new justice, to study the justice system to improve it. Um, and one of the uh, things it talked about was the 40%, three year 40% recidiv recidivism rate. Um, and they said it could be due to this or due to that, but one of them was uh, uh, lack of training, um, uh, lack of supervision get when they get out. Uh, so my question is, um, how do we encourage employers 
to hire long-term prisoners is do we offer any incentives? What do we do? Because, yeah, these guys want to work. Most of them, I'm sure they don't want to go back. But who is going to hire them? I probably wouldn't, have to be honest. Thank you for the question, and uh, you are correct. I didn't see the editorial, but as recently as last night, I received a telephone call from my colleague, Sheriff Tompkins, up in Suffolk County, who has expressed uh, a great deal of interest in being part of that, uh, uh, that process, that committee. Uh, and I think I'm going to get a lot of the sheriffs that want to do that, and a lot of people from within uh, the criminal justice system. The short answer to the question is I don't, I don't have an answer to that. If I did, I could probably, you know, just tell them not, don't bother with the panel. But this is what the panel is being uh, convened for. One of the things that we do know is that we have a plethora, we have a number of rehabilitative programs in all of our houses of correction. And, uh, you know, we, the one thing that we aren't always sure of is how effective those programs are individually and how much is the optimum period of time for a person to be in those. One of the things that this committee is going to do is to start to assemble the data so that we will understand what programs that our inmates are enrolling in that are, you know, number one, uh, taking care of that criminogenic activity. And I think you correctly point out that the most effective way to do that is to give them skills and to give them options when they get back to our communities to employ those skills in legitimate jobs. So the zillion dollar question is the one that you end with, which is how do we get employers, how do we incentivize? And that's the important thing. We, we need people to understand that, uh, as you correctly point out, virtually all of our inmates that are coming out are hungry to work. I can tell you while they're inside the House of Correction, they are hungry to work. They work on our county farm, they work in our community work crews, that's considered a privilege, and the inmates are very, very uh, happy to, to do those things. So hopefully we're going to get those answers that you seek because they're the same questions that I ask and answers that I seek and all of my colleagues. So thank you for that, and uh, there's going to be more to follow. Thank you. How you doing, guys? Uh, Kenzie Cardona. I'm a lifelong resident. I'm only 22 years old. Um, you know, I have a whole lot to say. I know I only have one minute, um, but I want to start off by identifying the power is in the youth in the community. And um, I have a lot of concerns regarding the youth and how they're being educated, um, which has everything to do with this institution of police, um, public safety. So I I'm wondering, you know, what are other preventative measures that, um, you know, maybe you guys had a conversation about, like, in order to uh, support the youth in, in order to like build uh, alongside the youth because what I see is a gap of understanding between the youth and the adults. You know, you're due to the uh, um, time. You know, I'm not going to say. <laughs> We're old. We're old. Yeah, you guys are pretty old. Um, so I, I wanted to bring that up. And also, um, I, I heard a comment earlier about 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Middle school is usually the target. And I will argue that you guys have to look further back, you know, because they, there's Technology is advancing uh, uh, society today, and it's evolving our culture. And in order to understand the youth, you have to understand all the, all the like, challenges and circumstances that they deal with that we don't have to deal with. So I feel, that, I feel as if, you know, just a personal statement that we have to dig deeper and, and bite, like nip it in the bud before we talk about solutions on how we can stop gunshots. How about like, fi like fixating the mindset behind you know, um, p picking up a gun, you know, or, you know, like thinking about future opportunities for how they can be employed and how they can sustain in the society. Because for a lot of people of uh, color, uh, and I will argue also that they are majority in Brockton, you know, rather than minority, um, I feel as if we need to focus more on what job opportunities will come about and also how the uh, public safety of the community will be able to relate to the students in the elementary school, middle school, and high school level. So then there will be a, a, a better relationship and there will be more resources that they can utilize in their future. So that's my question. Thank you. I'll just try to do a real quick response because we're running out of time. We have a lot of people still in line. Um, 
But just to clarify my statement, Kenzie, I said I believe that 6th, 7th, and 8th grade was the battleground. I didn't say that's where I thought it should start. I've been working with the school committee and advocating for a curriculum in 4th, 5th, and 6th grade um, because, you know, if kids are going to make decisions at the ages of, you know, 12 or 13 or 14, we need to start talking to them when they're 8. And I think that as we look at um, data as what type of curriculum works and NIHS data, it's not like the old-fashioned say no to drugs or that type of thing. What it's really about, it's the same curriculum for anti-gang and anti-drug uh, because it's really about starting to work with young people at a young age and helping them develop self-esteem, helping them uh, to feel as though that they have opportunity, helping them to uh, feel as though that they have opportunities to help them develop good decision-making skills and to help uh, help them develop skills to resist peer pressure. And you're right, those, those conversations have to start beginning in elementary school to give them the tools to succeed. I think we also at the schools are uh, proactively trying to identify young people that may be showing early warning signs of being at risk to drop out. And I think that that's in the middle schools where we have to identify those kids um, through a variety of means who may not have a, a responsible adult in their life guiding them right now uh, or other trauma situations that may be going on in their life. So all of those things, and I tried to allude to that briefly in my opening remarks, uh, but I didn't dwell too much on that because I really felt as though most of the people here tonight want to hear about what we're doing today. I agree with you wholeheartedly. The real solutions are the long-term solutions, and it's going to require us to invest money and commitment to it. you know, growing up in Brockton, you know, those programs that were, you know, uh, available were the GREAT program and the DARE program. I'm not sure if they're still running, but, um, you know, what I will state, you know, due to experience of, um, you know, I, I, I'm not able to, like, hear stories, you know, raw stories from those convicted felons who are able to go into high schools, into elementary schools, and those systems to, like, tell a life story. They cannot relate to somebody who will not, you know, walk that path with them. So, you know, I, I want to bring that up as well, and maybe we can talk about this after as well. All right, so thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Carla. I'm a lifelong resident of Brockton, as well as an organizer for the Coalition for Social Justice. And one of my, um, one of the questions, one of the questions I have is, um, what are we, just the preventative measures where it comes to youth programs, um, I know I live down the street, and there's, there's a lot of people my age down the street, and then they're t from 18 to 25. There's nothing really there for them. And when I was organizing one day, I met a, a drug dealer who didn't have crack at the time, so he was just sitting on the corner um, waiting for that shipment to come. And I was just like, what would you do besides sitting here waiting for those drugs? He was like, I would work. I would get myself into a program. And realistically, Brockton doesn't have youth programs or youth facilities like Boston and the, the Croc Center that they have for their whole entire community. There's not a community facility where we can harbor these children and guide them like you, you mentioned before and give them the right um, direction. We don't have that. The Boys and Girls Club is limited. There's 30,000 plus you know, youth. I don't think that can really foster all of our, 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 our generations, our future. So it's like, what are we doing to as a preventative measure to protect, to guide, and to assist our youth. So I agree with your premise, but I think what you're really talking about is identifying the, prob uh, the uh, programs in the schools so that kids are graduating from Brockton High School with a plan for their future that doesn't include sitting on the corner selling crack. So, um, you know, I, I think it's got to come from getting people graduated with a, not just a diploma but a plan and an initiative that we've really invested in the past two years. We piloted a program three years ago, um, Edison Academy, which is targeting overage, undercredited students that are either already have dropped out or have one foot out the door, uh, but when they're identified that it's just impossible for them to graduate um, chronologically on time, um, we now offer this afternoon and evening academy free, unlike adult education in the evening, free of charge, 
And I'll tell you that at the graduation ceremony last week, um, I shook the hands of 206 graduates of Addison Academy this year. Those are 206 young adults that previously were falling through the cracks that now have a diploma, and every single one of them has a plan for their future. It may be vocational training, it may be community college, but that's 206 young people that we didn't allow to fall through the cracks this year, and I think that's a real important initiative. Hello. Hi, I'm Gary P. Keith, Sr., and uh, first of all, I want to say, Mr. Mayor, I applaud you for the, uh, um, the cadets that you have right now in the academy. And I want to thank the fact that, to the chief, that we have a very good police department here in Brockton with everything that's going on in the, uh, around the country. We don't have those problems here, along with the state police that are in our city. But my question is for uh, DA Cruz. Um, the, mayor, the major said earlier that most of our violent crime is basically coming from uh, repeat offenders. So why is your office using some of these repeat offenders to put our neighborhoods and our police force back in jeopardy by using some of them for the advancement of your office? Well, am I good? All right. Well, we're not doing it for the advancement of the office and trying to solve some of these unsolved homicides, especially you know back happened back a few years ago. Well, at the time, when you, when you make those decisions, I mean, the, you try not to use the violent offenders. You know, you try to use information where you get the information from. But unfortunately, we have to deal with people, usually friends and associates, of those individuals or those crimes would still be unsolved. So you, tr you try to reach out to the information that you can get as best as you can, and you have to make a decision and vet it and corroborate it and see what you can do to go forward. There are always very difficult decisions. There's always very uh, difficult consequences from that. You try to do the best you can with what you have. Nobody has a crystal ball. It's an ex inexact science, and we do the very best we can. Quarry reform is what we need to help those gentlemen that when they come back into uh, population. Okay. In line, but if at this point, whoever the last person in the line is, if that would be fair, if that could be the last uh, us question. Hope you have a good one. There you go. Okay, my name is Lisa, and I'm sure a couple of you know exactly who I am. But I'm just going to reiterate to the man that was just before me. Why do we even have a mandatory gun charge if you are not going to uphold it and say, play God, and say, you know what, we're going to let this one go for six days later for him to go out and kill a child like mine? Because oh. my child did exist. Oh. In case you don't know who he is, he's right here. I'm very sorry if you lost me. I mean, we make the decision as best as we can. And, and, and the individual that, that murdered your child is certainly going to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. I'm very sorry if you lost. Well, why can't I get a hold of this office when I call six times and he won't return my call? Um, the question I have is for DA Tim Cruz. Um, it is obvious we have a lot of crimes in Brockton. But when you yourself are going to take responsibility of what's going on in Brockton, when you are going to take the responsibility of the crimes that is happening in Brockton right now, with all the emails, all these things that's going on to your office, why can you let somebody leave this place? Because it's a shame what's going on in Brockton. The corruption, the liars, you know? All this representation, it's beautiful, but it needs to be to practical solution. Community, communicate with people who really care. Don't bring some black people who have been bought by you and others to, this, to help you, because they're not going to help us. It's going to make Brockton more vulnerable to the issues that we're facing. Can you please think about it, Tim? Thank you. Thanks. You got it. Um, my name is Gigi Montero, um, resident of Brockton for 18 years. I just have to say, um, you guys are doing a great job in the city of Brockton, along the chief, with the staff I've been seeing around. I'm a business owner on North Main Street, and I've been falling through. I know it's a lot of crime happening in the city right now. Looking to myself, where I come from, 
a lot of times all those martyrs, I mean, called them Kavirian people. A shame on us. Because all this has to start from our home, from our parents. It should not be the police to lead our children. It should start from home. And um, I have to say, I work hard, and uh, I'm a mother of a two. And uh, I do take responsibility over my kids, tell them what they're supposed to do. Nobody is perfect. And Mr. Mayor, on the city of Brockton, like I said, residence for 18 years. I know City Hall right now. It's a, like, I feel like it's my house. It's an open door to all residents. God didn't build the world one day. It took him seven days on the Bible to build it. And if the community will come stronger, we can rebuild the Brockton. It seems a lot better what it was in the past in my city. And we have seven wards here. If we work wood by wood, team by team, I believe we clean this city, then we can turn Brockton beautiful city to raise our children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great comments. Thank you. Good day. Um, my question is for Mayor Bill Carpenter. Uh, my name is Derek. I'm a lifelong Brockton resident. I'm a college student. And I'm gonna, um, I work at the United Nations Association of Greater Boston and Harvard, teaching young, young children about global issues. Um, I just have a question about, with the $6 million deficit, how will the shot Sparta mechanism continue to be funded and maintained, given its almost forgotten prototype in 2008? And, how, and also, uh, I want to ensure that this is a project that will, be simp that will not be a fairy tale and not be told to the public, and also a couple months down the line not be forgotten. Well, I can tell you the city councilor won't be forgotten and it will be funded, but I'll let the mayor. One second for the mic here. Uh, well, we, we, my comment was that we had to overcome a $6 million budget. The city council approved a balanced budget that included the funding for ShotSpotter. We've made a three-year commitment to ShotSpotter. Um, it is a, a, it's a different model than the thing that was piloted eight years ago. So basically now it's providing a service. The upgrades are included in the money that we're spending for it. Um, and, you know, we vetted this out at great detail, looking at what I think what everyone here is saying tonight is, what everyone here is saying tonight is, what can you do to reduce the uh, illegal gun violence in the city? And we believe that this shot spotter, by allowing police to respond uh, within, or be notified within 30 seconds, of the exact location where a gun has been fired is going to allow us to not just make more arrests, but also to uh, identify witnesses and combining that with the crime analyst and the processing of the data that ShotSpotter will generate will make the city safer. But in the new model, the upgrades and technology are automatically built in. We've only made a three-year commitment. It was a joint commitment that we made with the city council and clearly we'll we'll go through a thorough review process at the end of three years to determine if we got the return on investment that we believe we're going to get. Good evening. And um, I just have, I'm a Brockton resident. I have a couple questions in a statement. Is the spot sort of a shot spotter, is it used in all areas of the city? And the mayor said earlier that there's only a small group of individuals that are causing the problems. And my question would be, can we put pressure on those small group of individuals to let them know that you're serious, get out there, I don't know how you do it. And I just want to give you an example. The other day I was at a gas station, I had four children, I had my kids in the car, I'm waiting to pay for my gas. There were two young men talking, and they said, wow, this city's really hot. There's been a lot of shootings. They start naming the streets, the kind of guns that were being used. I'm mortified because they're like, oh, yeah, it's on this street, this street. They're using 38s, and I'm mortified. Like, what do I do? I'm standing there at a gas station. They're having a, to them it was funny that whoever, firemen shots, and it's hot, it's going to be hot the next couple. What do I do with information? Like, what do you do? How do you? I'm going to ask. I'm 
gentleman actually passed it over. Let uh, Lieutenant Grice, who's our chief of detectives, uh, address that a little bit. In terms of the, um, well, let me just give it to Lieutenant Grice. With regards to the group of individuals that the, the mayor referenced earlier, um, it is. You know, the, the citizens in the city of Brockton, um, by far majority, are good people, and that's who we work for. There are people, and it works, that we target, that we know are doing this. It just takes time and sometimes a little bit of luck. All right, and um, it worked a couple of months ago, um, back in June, you know, um, when, when things fell off the radar screen after we were successful, um, and it will work again in this case here. It's just gonna take a little bit of time and maybe one break in the case, but, um, but it shouldn't go on. We, we, know, uh, we know who's doing this, and we need to, uh, we have constant pressure on them, is what happens. I might add that the paperwork I gave you, if you hear something, the public hears something, there's the anonymous tip line. It may be just a rumor that all these kids think they know everything that's going on, but send something to the tip line, correct? Any little bit of information you hear, you don't have to personally be call up and say this is, you know, Mary Smith. Send the information to the tip line. It may add something to something the police already have. So am I correct? Please get that information in. And this will be our last question of the night. Good evening. I'm Brian Carrigan. I'm not running for political office, so I don't have an agenda. I want to thank Sheriff McDonald for the use of the canine units. Let them all get bit in the ass, hurt when they sit down in jail. And my, my response is really to the, to the angry woman who spoke earlier. Um, she just took a couple of notes. There's 15 new police officers coming on board. The city has new cameras being installed. Bike patrols back in force. New fingerprint uh, being impl implemented. Instead of going 10 weeks, you're going 10 to 20 seconds. 1,300 streets in the city of Brockton, 138 patrolmen. Do the math. And they're not, all the patrolmen are not on the police force on duty at the same time. That's a lot of people. I want to thank everybody for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Clearly, there's a lot of frustration about the long term of uh, solving of these issues. Tonight's meeting was really a, much more about, and you can tell by the people that are on the bo uh, this panel, about short term what we're trying to do. Again, if you hear something on the street, take that paper with you, go to the city website. The uh, tip line, I believe, is right on the city website. Call the police station. If you think you see a crime, call. They may not always get there as quick as you think. But every little thing adds to something else. And again, I think that all of these law enforcement people would back me up on that, that cases are put together, as, as Lieutenant Grice says, a little at a time. So if you hear something at a police station, I mean at a gas station, send the information along. And I want to thank this whole board. I want to thank Councilor Monaghan for coming up with the idea. I, on behalf of the city and the residents of Ward 1, I thank all of you for being here tonight. And, uh, the crowd that we had here tonight shows that the good people are going to win in this city. So thank you very much for being here.